Okay, we're gonna start in five seconds, yeah? Five, four, three, two, one. Hi guys, and welcome to Piano and Keyboard Artist, where we discuss the artists related to pianos, keyboards, and synthesizers. And I was not lying. We're here with Mr. Rusty Egan, the legend himself. Hi. Rusty, how are you, sir? I'm very well. I didn't know it was called Piano and Keyboard Legend. Oh, well, uh, yeah, Piano and Keyboard Artists. Um, uh. So, Rusty, there is so much we can talk about. Yeah. Um, as I say, when Mark, um, one of my subscribers introduced me. He said he can get an introdu introduction with you. Yeah. So he said, Rusty Egan, I went, and I knew the name, but I couldn't picture it. So That's I, exactly who I am. So, so anyways, the, the point I'm trying to make is, guys, you go onto Google and you type in, you type in the name Rusty Egan, and then the name and the face, and you go, oh, that geezer. And I thought, I've seen this face everywhere. I even, even to my fiance, even to my dad. My dad said, I'm doing, I'm sorry, I'm doing this interview. He yeah. said, oh, I know the face. So what I'm trying to point out is, yeah, guys, Rusty, if you don't know the name, Rusty is a DJ, a musician, a producer, and what I would like to call a proper celebrity before, be, before celebrities became shit. You know, the, these days it seems like anyone could be a celebrity for going onto a TV show, and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. You can give me that tenner later. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it is interesting whenever you watch a documentary or any, any kind of nostalgia show, you will see Rusty because he's, as I say, he's, he, he's just kind of like the go-to guy. And he's a larger than life character. So this is probably as much as I'm going to be able to say. <laughs> yeah, you Rusty. won't get a word in once I start. <laughs> as I say, there is so many things you've done. And let's, let's just sort of start with one aspect of your career at the moment. Now, you were with the Rich Kids, Visage, um, Ultravox, Minjure. I mean, I mean, the list is endless. So let's start off with... The Blitz Club, the famous Blitz Club, 1980. You started that with Steve Strange in Covent Garden. Yeah. And what are your memories of that? Okay. <laughs> I, I, I could re-change what you just said. Go on. Okay. Number one, I'm a musician. Yeah, so you're a musician, a producer. I'm a drummer. Yeah. And so was Phil Collins, a drummer. Yeah. And um, uh, so was the lead singer of The Eagles, a drummer. Correct. And um, so was Dave Clark Five, a drummer. Mm -hmm. um, Cozy Powell, a drummer. Um, is that my phone? <laughs> I thought I'd put it on silent. <laughs> oh, somebody needs a drummer. I'll go and answer it. No, I'm not answering it. Sorry, I'm going to be interview, guys, silent. but uh, you signed up for this. So. <laughs> no, I thought I'd put it on silent. That was Mate, I love your busy. realness. Yeah, so. The this point one, is um, about a drummer mm. in the 70s was well, the drummer was the least uh, uh, respected member of the band and John Lennon famously said Ringo's not even the best drummer in the, the Beatles. Beatles. That's right, yeah. Um, and then other people went, the drummer is the backbone of the band. Mm -hmm. And as a drummer, I was first attracted to drumming through my parents, who were musicians, mm -hmm. and my dad telling me about these famous drummers like Phil Seaman, um, who was a, a drug addict drummer, and he used to proudly tell me how they used to put him on his stool, and then the jazz musicians would play intricate, intricate time signatures, which is where I learned about take five, two, three, four, one, two, mm -hmm. four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and believe it or not, I followed uh, intricate drummers like Bill Bruford and a band called Egg. Mm -hmm. And these guys were all keyboard kind of hippie, which sort of led me to Tangerine Dream and led me to um, uh, electronic type, what would you call them now, sort of a serious. Serious music. Yeah, yeah, not pop, not that, yeah. you know, nine minute long track. Dio yeah. Dato, Dio yeah, Dato. Yeah, 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 yeah. So as my dad was into jazz and as I was into learning the drumming mm -hmm. and learning the time signatures, um, I went for the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And there were like four drummers and you got to sit there and they picked you and you went up and then, it was like that film with the drummer, you know? Oh yes, yes, yes. That yes. film and, yeah. and, and you were crap and you were kicked back again and you had to go and learn your paradiddles. 
and uh, so you so you were learning all day long here and then you heard Hawaii Five-O, you know, the drumming. You found a bloke called Billy Cobham, mm -hmm. who was played in my Blitz Club sets, um, a track called Storm. So anyway, the point was I was really into being a virtuoso musician mm -hmm. as a drummer, mm -hmm. uh, not just Ringo. Mm -hmm. And I went to see Billy Cobham, and they had like the drums like that, you know, and he could go, mm -hmm. you know. Anyway, two or three drummers, Ahead of me was Richard James Burgess. And Richard James Burgess um, used to wear clogs and uh, he'd slip them off and he'd just sit there and he was like a machine. He'd just, the legs, he'd just, just do it. He was like, and I was looking at him and listening to him and thinking, my God, it's going to take me, it's going to take me years to be able to play like these guys. And then the payday was. Oh, the guy's in Jesus Christ Superstar. You go, what? That's where you were going to be if you were an amazing drummer. You'd be in the orchestra pit. It's like, oh, I don't want to be that. You know, I'm not going, I'm not killing myself to be the drummer in a theatre playing Jesus Christ Superstar. Forget that. And um, so I started answering adverts. Drummer wanted. And they'd normally sort of say, Crosby, Stills and Nash, California. And Bob and I just went around everywhere, reggae, whatever. And he just played with everyone till he met some people that possibly might want to make some music. Mm -hmm. Now this is 70s. Mm -hmm. This is pre, pre sort of like punk, mm -hmm. before punk. This is like Rod Stewart's in the charts. David Bowie's in the charts, Alice Cooper's in the chart, pop music is in the chart. But albums were like where the musos were, you That's know. Right, yeah. You know, you, you listen to Edgar Frouse and you know, you listen to all these like experimental people because you were a musician and you met other musicians who had fretless basses and talked about Jaco Pastorius and and, <laughs> and again it was like this is too complicated, this is too much, you know. Um, how come all these pop bands have got three chords, you know? Mm, mm, mm. You know, yeah. son of my father, you know? Mm. And on that record, son of my father, was... <laughs> mm, 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 mm. And what, what is that? And watching the old Grey Whistle Test, I saw Brian Eno. Yes. And he wasn't a musician, he, he, he's just a bloke twiddling knobs. A knob twiddler, is yeah. that? Yeah. And then, 1974, I think it was, um, uh, 73 maybe, mm. Autobahn was this novelty record, as was Popcorn. Mm. Do, 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 do. You know, the synthesizer was like Rolf Harris, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey. So, Electronics was like tomorrow's world. It was, mm. and you were a kid watching Top of the Pops. You saw two drummers with Gary Glitter. Don't mention the name. <laughs> and you saw Dave Clark at the front. And you thought, I want to play the drums, but I don't want to play that music. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to play that music. So I answered all these adverts. And to very quickly jump it, I spent three months playing with The Clash. And because that three months connected me to Glenn Matlock, mm -hmm. and it connected me to the punk scene, mm -hmm. and I went out every night, and I was at the Banshees, I was at, you know, the Sex Pistols, I was yeah. at the Clash, I, was, I met everyone, and I saw everyone. And arrogant, I thought they were all crap drummers. They were all crap, you know. Because I'd been this virtuoso sure. drummer, sure. Jazz orchestra, time signatures. Mm. I could go around the drum kit, and there were people going, oh, yeah. one, two, three, four. And, <laughs> and of course, I'd been in the room when we, I didn't write, but you know, career opportunity is the only job you get. London's burning, <laughs> London's burning with, and piece of piss. I was like that, piece of piss. But the Clash weren't looking for a drummer, they were looking for a fourth member of the band. Oh who was politically aware that London's burning with boredom, that was politically aware that I'm so bored of the USA. Well, I wasn't. And I was like, sort of, yeah, all right. 
I don't fucking care. Just play the song. And they were like, no, we've we got to cut your hair and put you in these zipped up trim. We've got to spray you. And, and I was like, way, get someone else. You know? I'm not doing that. Because I'm quite into my clothes, I quite mm-hmm. like what I'm wearing. I, I thought right, I looked good. Yeah, right. I was down the King's Road, I had straight jeans on, I was like, you know, I was clued up. Yeah. And um, I wasn't going to be a clothes horse, I wasn't going to be told what to do. So um, to get very quickly, I went through the whole punk scene, mm-hmm. playing with loads of bands. Mm-hmm. The way I looked at it, easy, you know. Yeah. Nothing intricate there. Still really into Bill Bruford and uh, mm-hmm. people like that, you know. And uh, went to see them, you know. Went to see um, National Health. I mean, really odd, weirdo people um, making weird music. And then I met Glenn Matlock. So that brought me to the, to, to to the Rich Bruce. Kids. Oh, to the Rich Kids, yeah. And that brought me to mid Ah, OK. And we brought in... Um, Mick Ronson from David Bowie's Spiders from Mars, okay. who produced the Rich Kids album. Yes. And that brought me into how to record. Mm-hmm. And we did it in Johnny Conger's studio. Mm-hmm. Johnny Conger's, I'm going to step on you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we did it in his studio. Mm-hmm. And then we toured the country and got spat out and had bottles thrown at us. And that was my first experience of like Manchester and um, <laughs> yeah. I thought, scum, scum, I like Roxy music. We, we, <laughs> you know, we're not like that. So Midge and I got a CR78 drum machine mm-hmm. and we got um, a CS80 Yamaha. Yes. And we recorded in the year 2525 mm-hmm. by Zager and Evans to see how it worked, mm-hmm. you know. Ooh. We had the vocoder, and we made that, and we thought, and I played that in the Blitz, and oh. people danced to it, and I mixed it with uh, the model by Kraftwerk, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I thought, oh, it works, it works. We're making music that fits with the music I love. Mm-hmm. And the music I love is very well documented. You can go to my YouTube channel. Absolutely. There's not a channel. It's yeah. just Rusty Egan playlist. Yeah. It had about six, seven hundred tracks on it. And then, you know what they do on YouTube? Yeah. Deleted. They do, yeah. I forgot what it was. Yeah, like, <laughs> what was that? What's been deleted? I don't know. I don't manage it. Yeah. I just put a library up there because so many people put up libraries sure. of Rusty Egan. And I see tracks. I didn't play that. Mm. I didn't play that. They think I played that, you know. Yeah. So the real point for anyone watching your channel is, what did Rusty Egan do in 1978, 9, that instigated the sound of the 80s? Yes. That's the important thing. Um, and what I did was, I did exactly what anybody does today. I hate all the music that's being sold to us today. I hate, no, but I hated it in 1979 because punk was, I've got your number written on the back of my hand. No, that's not punk. You're trying to tell us this band is a, a punk band? Yeah, my Sharona, that is not punk, that is not punk. Yeah, well, we're a new wave band. You're, it's not punk, it's not new wave, it's just a record company cashing in on three-minute pop songs that have been written by people like the Buzzcocks. What do I get? Oh, three-minute pop songs is what punk was. Pop songs that meant something to 18, 17-year-old kids who had no future and no job in a dull and grey and horrible world. In the meantime, in Manchester, some people were listening to Noi. They were listening to German music. They were heavily influenced by German music. So much so, they called themselves Joy Division, which was also punk in attitude, because you just don't go there. Whoa! In the meantime, some people went, we're the Moors murderers, you know, we're the sex whatever. You know, people were naming themselves in shocking type names. But at the end of the day, what Joy Division were doing we're listening to something called the motoric drummer. And the motoric drummer is a beat. And it went up. And 
and they were like, and you could just keep going. You could just keep going. You could just sing, you know, every song you want. Love, love will tear us apart again. Right? But you could go red light, white light over in Liverpool. Then you could go over to um, Leeds. And over in Leeds, you had Soft Cell. And everybody was at that kind of tempo. And then it would go, boom. Ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. I'm lost in a forest. And as a drummer, I was like, I want to hear that in a club. I don't want to hear Get Up and Boogie and it's Ladies Night and the Bee Gees. Why can't you play the Cure? Why can't I hear Joy Division? Why do I have to stand there next to a girl and go, hi, hi. <laughs> um, I hate the music. Yeah, I hate the music too. There's nowhere else to go. So it was like, girls, clubs, great music, just put them on. It's not rocket science, is it? No. I can do that. So when the rich kids got spat at too much, and when we did in the year 25-25, Midge and I, working on my drumming, I went... And then Midge went, ba da ba, ba da ba ba, ba da da da, ba da da da, da 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 da, da 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 da, ba 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 ba. And we had the dancer, and the reason it was the dancer was because we wanted people to dance to that beat, change the beat, and. Basically, um, we had these two songs and we played them in the Blitz Club and people danced. And I thought, this is working. This music's working. And um, with my record collection, more and more people would see bringing more and more people, more and more people just like whatever the sound was. Mm. And they didn't know it was Hiroshima Monomura by Ultravox, or they didn't know. They were just clubby, student-y people. These were underground records. Magazine, Ultravox, Kraftwerk, Neu, Can, Le Dusseldorf. Nobody knew what the music was, but they loved it. Mm. What, what is that music they're playing in the Blitz Club? I love it. And, you know, obviously they knew David Bowie and Roxy Music and Grace Jones and Lou Reed, but... I was running out of music every week playing Satellite Love, every week playing David Bowie, every week. And every week on the radio, a new new wave band that would just meant nothing. Public Image I played, Susie and the Banshees I played, but not many. I was more interested in this sound. So then I started to um, invite down Billy Curry, John McGeer, Dave Formula Magazine, um, and Phil Lynott was coming down because of Mitch. And um, they were coming up and saying, what's that record, what's that? And they were going to their bands and, and, and writing songs, saying, I heard this record the other night that Rusty played. And uh, then I started to recognise it in the records that were starting to be sent to me by people. I've got this record, Simple Minds, first record, you know. Um, so I went out shopping and I found Human League, um, Dignity of Labour, and um, I found um, Patrick D. Martin, I Like Electric Motors. A very odd, odd record, but I squeezed it in. But I found Yellow, mm -hmm. yeah. Yellow Magic Orchestra, mm -hmm. Telex, and I sort of built this little playlist up of this sound of odd people that came from Belgium, Sweden, Russia, um, all over there, but not American rock and uh, American music and soul and funk and disco. Obviously, I played what you would consider to be um, today high energy gay disco, mm. but it wasn't, it was I Feel Love, it was Georgia mm. Moroder, it was uh, Sylvester. Good stuff, yeah. Yeah. So, as you see, guys, this gentleman here has got a lot to say. You were actually very 
you discovered a lot of acts. I think it was Spandau Ballet in the Blitz Club that you sort of yeah. put, you, you are responsible, and people wouldn't know this, for, for actually giving a lot of people their break. It was you who introduced craft work to us. In, in the I Blitz went Club. to Dusseldorf yeah. Yeah, yeah. and met with craft work exactly. so for every single record I could get my hands on. So you're kind of be, uh, behind all this. Uh, yeah. I'm what you call the invisible man. The invisible man. And um, only until now, when I'm picking up my pension, okay. and haven't written the book, mm. and haven't told anyone, mm. uh, am I being more outward? Mm. Let's put it like this. Today's society mm -hmm. of people are wannabes who want to be famous. Yes. I have never wanted to be famous. Mm. So much so, I'm not in the videos of any of the records that I played on. Yes. You might get a cameo role of a crowd of people. Mm. Um, so, when I was touring with the rich kids with an ex-sex pistol, a lot of punk people came to see us and it included a bloke in Newport in Wales called Steve Strange. Mm -hmm. And Steve Strange had been going to the Wigan Casino, taking blues, staying up all night and dancing to Tainted Love. At the age of 14 or 15, he was an original punk with dyed hair, punk clothes, what you would describe today as the only gay in the village. <laughs> And he used to go to London to go out all night and go and see bands and have nowhere to stay. Except he knew this bloke called Rusty. Ah. And he said, he used to show up and say, can I sleep on your floor? So, in order to find gainful employment for Steve Strange, because we went out to clubs every night and I heard good music, George Moroder, and rubbish, I said, these clubs are good, they're lovely people, but the music, mm -hmm. what's wrong with that? Why, why, why is it all backwards? Mm -hmm. it's, there's so many great records, they're not playing here either. So I said, let's find a sleazy little club in Zoho, we'll pack it, I'll put the records on, get you another DJ if I have to go and be in a band, you know, but I'll give him my record collection. And I said, what's the one thing, Steve, that joins us all together? And he went, ah, fashion. Yeah, yeah, fashion. Ah, sex pistol. Ah, I said, no, David Bowie. Throughout punk, David Bowie is still the man. David Bowie, Iggy Pop. He just played it on tour with Iggy Pop. Berlin, Heroes, German. You know, you know. What we need is the David Bowie record collection which I don't have. I don't have every single record he ever made. I said, but I know a bloke who has. And we went and knocked on his door and I said, look, I need to borrow your record collection of rare bootlegs. <laughs> I'm not letting you borrow that. I said, you can come to the club, we'll give you free drinks full of girls. You'll love it. Just when I ask for a record, David Bowie and Bing Crosby, you just let me play it. So the bottom line is, he does that, and I go, David Bowie and Bing Crosby, and he brings me this record, he goes, wait, wait, got a pair of gloves, <laughs> a little cloth, giving it a wipe, puts it on, like that, and it's like, no, I'll put the needle, because you're not going to scratch it. <laughs> I'm saying, you've got one minute, come on. And then, of course, he played the record. And it'd be like, look, I want to play David Bowie's stage album live, you know, I want that track. And so I didn't have to buy the entire David Bowie record collection. His name was David Claridge, lovely guy. So the bottom line was, I would choose the record and then he'd put the needle on, the David Bowie ones. And then I go, I'm going to put Jean Michel Jarre on, go to the bar because there's a beautiful looking woman over there and I want to go and talk to her. He goes, yeah, but everybody will be bored. You're not going to get bored with a Jean-Michel Jarre record. It's beautiful, and it's only 10 o'clock. We're in a nightclub. Leave it play for 20 minutes. Doesn't matter. And then put Kraftwerk on. That'll last 20 minutes. We're not going to dance until later. 
And then I'd go and talk to everyone. So basically, while I was doing that, he was standing in the DJ booth going through his record collection and getting a little pile of Bowie tracks that he loved. Anyway, when you mentioned Spanner Ball, etc., coming to the club now was girls, just like punk. We went to see the Sex Pistols and we formed a band. All right. We went to the Blitz and we formed a band. We didn't need a drummer. We had a drum machine. Yeah. We had two fingers, like three chords in punk. And then we would go and talk to Rusty. He said, Rusty, um, got this song and we got this band. And then I'd be like, you look like shit and you haven't got a synth. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> got to look great. Look at David Bowie, he looks amazing. And then a month later, we talked to a guy and he had a haircut, looked like the Human League. I go, yeah, do you remember us last month? Yeah, we've got a band, you know. So anyway, the point was, I knew what I wanted, I knew what the sound was, I knew what you had to be, and when I went around the country, I'd met people in Leeds and Birmingham, Manchester, in the punk days, I played in Birmingham. Have you heard of this band, Duran Duran? No, I've never heard of them. I'll get you their record. And it was bloody good record, you know, it was like that. Have you heard of this band, Soft Cell? Girl with a painted leather face. And I met this bloke called Steve-O, who comes from Dagenham. Oh, yes. And he was putting together this album, and he played me tracks from the album, Blumange, and I was like, I like all this. Mm. But Steve Strange was like, Steve-O, get him out of the club, he looks terrible, he's not, he's not. I said, I don't care, he's a fat little bloke come from Dagenham, I don't care. He's got a great band. Mm. Yeah, but he's a, he's a, and it was all by judgmental, you know, it was all, ah, he's, he's not cool. Mm. So anyway, um, about, when, I, I don't know what year it was, about 1981 maybe, in order to dispel the um, elitism of Spanner Ballet and Steve Strange and you can't get in the club and you've got to be cool. Mm. I created from the Blitz to the Sticks Monday night at Flicks in Dartford and I went out to the suburbs and I put on Depeche Mode, a band from Billericay in bloody Essex and I said, fuck all your elite crap, these bands are great. Yeah. And, it, and these kids love this music. And I put like 500 suburban kids into this club. And I DJed all day. And I also put on Soft Cell. Mm -hmm. And Ronnie, and a few others who will tell me today, oh, we played for you, but we split up, you know, girlfriend got pregnant, you know, her mum didn't, whatever, yeah. the usual. Yeah. But I basically put on bands. I put them on in the suburbs. And some Blitz kids came. But not that like coach trip, you know, we'll go and support Rusty. And I was like, there's 500 kids here, mate. This is not about being elite and being cool and whatever. Yeah. It's about the music. And uh, I then did a night called St. Valentine's Day Ball. And I hired the Rainbow, which nearly killed me financially. <laughs> It's like 4,000, 5,000 capacity or something. So anyway, I, I lost money, but I had Ultravox. Mm -hmm. Metro that I used to play in, do you know Metro? I know the name, yeah. He wrote Criminal World on the David Bowie album. Oh, okay. But he also wrote yeah. um, for Ronnie, okay. the French girl that I made, uh, which is on my new album, yeah. Back to the Future. Anyway, so basically I had all these artists that I loved. I had video screens, I had craft work videos, I had a DJ from Birmingham, Dick from the Run Runner, I had yeah. the DJ from, from the Billericay, I had the Pesh Mode, I had Soft Cell, and basically I was kind of like, I've done it now. Mm. There you go, that's it, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs>